Hello buddy, my name is Eric, and today we're going to be looking at the CVSS 9.9 .9 vulnerability that affects all GNU slash Linux systems. So well, that's sort of how it was initially spread, and we'll go through the reality of it. Is it overblown, and what does it actually do? So, what we have here is attacking Unix systems via CUPS. Now CUPS is the common Unix printing system, it's actually developed by Apple, and was intended to make printing on Unix-based systems easier. So we'll read the preface. So this quote is interesting. From a generic security point of view, a whole Linux system as it is nowadays is just an endless and hopeless mess of security holes waiting to be exploited. I wouldn't go that far, but Linux security definitely, especially on the desktop, is not as good as many people assume it is, and uh, this security incident is relatively severe. So what's happened here? is a combination of vulnerabilities leads to remote code execution. So first of all, we have this one. Cups browsed binds on this IP address trusting any packet from any source to trigger a get printer attributes request, which then goes to an attacker-controlled URL. So this gets the vulnerable system, so this gets the vulnerable system to connect back. Then this does not validate or sanitize those attributes, so, and, and this is how uh, the actual execution happens, is you can inject a command line parameter into this, so you can add a printer to someone's computer without authentication, and if they ever try and print through that printer, that's how the actual vulnerability works. So this is substantially less bad than something like Eternal Blue, which allows you to take over a system with zero authentication or interaction. If you want to see that, you can go see my Windows XP or Server 2003 videos where malware just installs itself. It's not that bad, but it's still pretty severe. So a remote unauthenticated attacker can silently replace existing printers or install new ones with a malicious one, resulting in arbitrary command execution when a print job is started. Now, on the public internet, you just send a UDP packet. Now, there is a problem this course, which is much like why the Eternal Blue isn't a huge issue these days. Unless you're running a server, your computer is probably not directly exposed to the internet, and if you have a properly configured firewall, this port should not be exposed. But the other way this can be triggered is over LAN. You can spoof a zero-conf MDNS advertisement and achieve a similar code path. And then you get a very, very bad uh, security tech. I actually saw this one on X a few month a month ago, and I thought, oh, yikes. Yeah, I mean, any uh, network worm is only a problem if the port is exposed to the internet or the network, but... Yeah, that's that's not quite right. Now, of course, this vulnerability is going to be very broad, because CUPS is used on essentially every modern Unix system. And, of course, macOS is also on the list, because, I mean, it was Apple who developed it. Although I don't know if they shipped the browsed extension. Now here, as a result of port scanning, he's discovered that hundreds of thousands of devices do have this enabled on the public internet. And this file contains a list of uh, systems that have called. Now this works because the kernel information is actually called back when you when you send this request, so wow, all the way back to 2.6 where you could probably find a myriad of other problems. Uh, 2 going down, oh wow, yeah, all the way to the very latest version across a wide variety. Someone exposed a Gen 2 system, you can find out. Some of these actually, because Xanmod, Licorix, uh, these are usually installed by gamers, so some people are definitely exposing their Linux PCs to the entire internet. So you can get rid of the CUPS browsed service, update CUPS, and if you can't update it, just put that on the firewall. You can also do that. I think that's a bit far. I mean, it's not like Windows hasn't had uh, vulnerabilities with printing, but what is a bit concerning here was how the developers of this initially responded. Now here they discover how this was initially discovered, and this is something that's always interesting to do, is see what ports are open by default. In terms of network vulnerabilities, an open port can be a vulnerability. Now, I checked, and my Arch desktop system does not have this vulnerability, because I, I never installed Cups Browsed, and none of my servers have it. But if you installed a desktop distro on a server, you may be at risk. And here is the code that binds it. And of course, we've got the joy of memory unsafe C where any number of things can potentially get in. 
we've got some parsing code that, of course, the allowed by default will just always return true. And here is the parsing. So first of all, uh, let me check that. So of course, what you can then do is fuzz this, and this is where uh, several things were discovered. But this vulnerability, or potential vulnerability, is not even the main problem. Now here is where the main problem comes. I just thought I would provide a somewhat happy update to this. So this security researcher has done some analysis of this function. It's unlikely to result in any interesting information, which is very good news. Still a problem, still embarrassing. Uh, but the good news is that nothing terrible is going to come because on every relevant architecture, it's just going to get a null byte. You could maybe get a timing attack, but this is unlikely to result in anything drastic, especially because it is going to be patched. Still, important to check because that wasn't immediately knowable. Now by using uh, and slightly modifying this IPP server package, they were able to quickly enough design an exploit. And an execution path is found with this Fumatic rip filter, which apparently has been exploited many times before. And this security problem was apparently just kind of ignored. And this is Fumatic rip. So, okay. So it does some sort of print translation. And because of how that works, it seems to just kind of rely on what are essentially arbitrary scripts. That's a bit scary. And there's even a video of this exploit in process. successfully created a file. So, that was kind of, according to this person, that was the easy part. Now, what wasn't so easy was going through and trying to report this vulnerability. First of all, the difficulty was getting the developers to accept that there was a vulnerability, so they submitted a Vince report, and then the worst thing that happened was it got leaked. From Vince... Uh, it got leaked over onto breach forms. Not even for money. Someone just copy and pasted it. I, I would almost wonder, given this is a new user on breach forms, if this was uh, someone who was just upset about the whole. So that's the conclusion of this article. So, how bad is this vulnerability? Well, it's definitely less bad than Eternal Blue or any of the Windows Networm vulnerabilities, but it's still very bad. And of course, the worst thing was the amount of pain that this person went through trying to uh, disclose it. They've said they're not going to do any more uh, of this with because it was such a pain, which is a terrible, terrible situation. And it is the trouble is with an open source system or, or more of a modular system rather than an open source system is sometimes there are pieces of the system that are not well maintained or documented where these things can come through. And of course, the most alarming thing is that this Vince system had a leak, so this was actually able to escape and be sold on breach forms before it was disclosed. Or worse yet, uh, it could have actually made its way into being exploited before it was disclosed, because the exploit here is very simple. Now, heading on over to Shodan, we can actually get a list of all of the different services that have an open uh, port 631 exposed to the internet, and we get over a million results, with 700,000 in the United States, followed by China, followed by Israel, followed by Korea, and all sorts of different ISPs, with Google having a staggering number. Most of these are, in fact, cops, but then there are other things. Some people seem to be running HTTP servers on that port. And most of the operating systems are unidentified. I'm going to assume that the Windows uh, reports are going to be mostly false positives. Now, for reference, another insecure port that has caused trouble, uh, SMB, 
Uh, well, that's got 1.7 million, and hopefully all of these are patched against Eternal Blue. Maybe not all of them, I mean, we just got an LCE notice here, but hopefully a lot of them are. So, is it worthy of a 9.9? .9? Well, I think the only real... I, I don't buy into the argument that it would have to be exposed to the internet or that a firewall could stop it, because that is a common misconfiguration, just like with Eternal Blue which is still being exploited, by the way. I saw a Windows server host selling a server that came with an image that was vulnerable to Eternal Blue out of the box and would probably get taken over by I, an Eternal Blue who exploit before you would even be able to log into it. So th that is absolutely still a problem. But the main benefit for servers, and basically anything exposed to the internet these days is a server because it costs too much like, IP addresses are now valuable, so you're not going to have your home computer exposed to the internet. So given that, and the fact that A, online servers may not have this installed, and B, they're probably not printing anything, means that the known exploit is probably not a, going to cause a massive amount of disruption. But the good thing is, hopefully this entire category of vulnerabilities will be fixed before it becomes widely used. But as we often see with hosting providers using out-of-date uh, server images, th this vulnerability is going to have a long tail. So that's going to be all from me for now. Let me know what you think in the comments. Bye!